privilege it is for for me to be here today. You know, a couple of years ago when God told us that our time uh, to lead Grace Assembly in Singapore, uh, the time was up and we needed to move on, uh, God gave me the assurance that after this, God was going to prepare us for even greater ministry than we've ever seen before. And I said, God, is there life after Grace Assembly? You know, up to this point, we have spent about 25 years of our life with Grace Assembly. We've seen fantastic miracles. We've seen the church grow. They're all just about ready to uh, dedicate the building in just a, two or three more months. They're, it's on schedule, and, and, and it was a $48 million U.S. project, and it's paid for. Uh, in, incredible miracle that was there. But then God quickly opened the door and I couldn't believe that there would be life after Grace Assembly. Not only do we have the wonderful privilege to minister together with you folks here, but God has opened the door. Years ago when I was a teenager, God gave me a country that I needed to be involved in, that my wife and I would need uh, ultimately when uh, we, we would move together to, to serve somehow, some way. And somehow that door didn't open and now the door is so wide open it's not funny. God has opened a door that in, in even, even, even a few days time, I will be doing things that, that, that surpass anything I've ever done in my life and ministry. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My friend, we are faithful to God. God's going to do the work. Today, I want to talk to you about moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Pastor Paul, Go Pastor Paul Goulet said to, to me, would you teach on this area? I'm so glad we have a church that believes in the move of the Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. You may not realize this, but ICLV is unique in, among many churches across America. And when we're looking at six or 7.3 billion people in the world, almost 7.4 billion now, you're, you're looking at more problems, more crises, uh, all kinds of things happening in the world today. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the breakthrough of the Holy Spirit, and this church is that way. I thank God for our prophetic conferences. I thank God for the Holy Spirit conference we had just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we, as a church, we're learning to move and grow in the area of the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, those of you who were vitally involved in the Holy Spirit Conference, you may remember Monday night. This place was jammed out at, on Monday night. And Sean Bold shared a word for me. I was seated right there in the front row. And he shared things that nobody could have known. He could never have known those things. And it was an assurance. God knows where I live. And God is watching over my life. You see, when God works through the word of knowledge, he's saying, I know where you live. And I am going to do a mighty work in your life. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And then, and then on Wednesday morning, uh, Pastor Denise got the inspiration to have me get up before the, the preaching of the word. And she said, teach our people how to move into the gift of interpretation. And so, so I did. And I want to do that with you because not all of you were here for that Wednesday morning. I want to show you today how easy it is to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Okay, I'm going to be giving you some very basic key wonderful principles to to show you how you can be free but but i want you to turn first of all to first corinthians chapter 14 now i'm not preaching yet i'm going through a lab session do you understand what a lab session is we're not talking about theory we're talking about practice and for those of you who speak in tongues i want to show you how you are going to give the uh, gift of interpretation all right first corinthians chapter 14 please first corinthians Chapter 14, verse 13 and 14 says this. All right, verse 13. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. Why have we not seen that over all these years? Any of you who speak in a tongue should pray that you may interpret. Verse 14, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. All right. Now where the problem has come over all of these years is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. It's a misunderstanding of scripture. 
The best commentary on the gifts of the Spirit is the Bible. When we understand the Bible correctly, we will flow in the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. The problem people have on the gift of interpretation or the gift of tongues is they think mysteries means mysterious. Now, that's not what it means. In the New Testament, the word mystery always, always, always refers to what was hidden in the Old Testament and is now revealed in Jesus Christ. In other words, when you're speaking in tongues, do you know what you're saying? You're saying, He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're saying He's the soon coming King. You're saying He's all powerful. You're saying He has completed the plan of redemption. You're saying the power of the resurrection life lives within me. Those are the things you are declaring. What was hidden in the Old Testament is now revealed in Jesus Christ. But many of us in Pentecostal charismatic movement have, have heard a, a cute little teaching that speaking in tongues is a secret code language that the devil doesn't understand. Where is that in the Bible? All right. Now, does the devil understand all earthly languages? Okay, of course. On the day of Pentecost, there were 15 languages. Were they earthly languages? Did the devil understand the languages on the day of Pentecost then? Of course he did. Before the devil was the devil, who was he? He was an angel. All right, does he understand heavenly language? Of course he does. You see, it's not a secret code language. When I pray in tongues, I want the devil to understand everything I'm saying. Because I am declaring you have been defeated. I'm declaring God is victorious. I'm declaring there's the power of the resurrection. I'm declaring that the plan of God is being fulfilled. And the devil has no place in the plan of God. I'm declaring God's victory over my family. I hope he hears it. I hope he understands it. Because I am declaring God's victory. Amen. Amen. Oh, when you begin to understand that. Now, so first of all, you know the, the basic content. It's what Jesus has already accomplished for us. And the, the speaking in tongues is God's spirit touching my spirit to praise him, to worship him. So you know speaking in tongues is worship. Speaking in tongues is praise. In 1 Corinthians 14, he says, it's thanksgiving. It is praise. It is prayer to God. Okay, so as we're praising God, you already know the content. Secondly, I want you to notice 1 Corinthians 14, 14 again. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. My spirit prays. Now, I don't know where all of your spirits are here this morning. Some of you may be thinking about lunch. Some of your spirit is thinking about the football games in the afternoon. Some of you are, are, are thinking about somebody that offended you during the week. But as you're worshiping God, you, you should know where your spirit is, whether it's joy or the peace of God, or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the magnificence of God. You should know where your spirit is. Today in worship, as Pastor Mike was leading us, there was a beautiful sense of the peace of God and the control that God has in our lives. Now, what we're going to do, you see, it's my spirit that prays, so you should know at least where your spirit is. You're halfway to the interpretation. You know the content because it is praise, it is worship, it is thanksgiving, it is declaring the great work of Jesus Christ. You know the content. It is your spirit that prays. You see, the beautiful thing about this is that the Bible teaches us if you pray in a tongue, you can pray that you may interpret. Now, I want to tell you that I don't normally pray for the interpretation, maybe about 1% of the time. But how beautiful it is when I began to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. And sometimes I hear God say, my son, I'm proud of you. My son, in spite of your weaknesses, you have moved on. Oh, my son, I love you. And oh, how beautiful that is when God touches you that way. Okay, what we're going to do today, we're going to spend a few minutes in a lab session. You thought you came to church to hear somebody preach. I'll preach in just a moment. I want you all to stand. 
I want you all to stand. And if you can speak in tongues, you speak in tongues. If you don't, you praise God in English. But I want you to listen to your spirit. Okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? You see, it's so, so, so many times we talk, but we don't listen. And when we're praising God, we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. So, what I want us to do is begin to praise God in tongues. By the way, I, in Asia, we typically sing in, in the Spirit, okay? In America, a lot of people just pray in the Spirit. They don't sing. What's the difference between praying and singing in the Spirit? Music, melody. Why don't we come to church and we just read off the words? You know, my, Pastor Mike is playing the guitar and leading us in, in worship and we just read the words out. Okay, so you, you don't mind if I sing in the Spirit. Now, I, I, I don't want to persecute the saints. All right, I, I don't sing like Mike Lighty, not, not a, by any means, but I, I'm doing this to kind of walk you into this. I want us to begin to praise God in the heavenly language, to worship the Lord, and you sense what God is touching you with. All right? Let's begin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, how many of you, how many of you, as you were praying in tongues, you just sense God giving you an impression in your spirit? Maybe it was a picture. Maybe it was a word. Maybe it was a sentence. It will, or, or, or maybe it was a, a sense of lifting in your spirit or something like that. Can you raise your hand, please? Raise your hand. All right. You see, that is the road to interpretation right there. Now, we're going to try another one. Okay, I want you to think about the biggest challenge in your life right now. And we're going to speak in tongues. Now, speaking in tongues, we're not talking to the devil. You understand that? You never have to talk to the devil because the devil will lie to you. We're praising God. We're declaring God's victory over that situation that you're facing right now. All right? Let's pray in tongues that way. But let's listen to what God's saying in our spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we could go on for the whole service in this exercise. But how many of you just sense something that God is saying something to you as you began to speak in tongues that way? Just raise, raise your hand. Wave your hand at me. Praise God. Praise God. When I do this with a class, maybe of 30 people, I, I ask for feedback. We take an hour or more on this, but because of, of time, I just want you to experience listening in your spirit. Maybe one more, one more. I just, this is not warfare, just sheer delight. Just sheer delight. John Wesley, John Wesley, the great holiness preacher, was asked by, by somebody, he said, uh, uh, John Wesley, can a Christian dance? And John Wesley, with a twinkle in his eye, said, you can't be a Christian unless you dance. Now, of course, he's not talking about the worldly dance. And I don't, I, I don't do a lot of dancing. But it's the joy of the Lord. That's what he's talking about. And so this one, we're not talking about requests. We're not talking about needs. We're just delighting in the Lord, okay? 
Let's just delight in the Lord. Kindarabo Shurai, who Yarabori, who Yarabori, who Yarabori, who Yarabori, Hallelujah, 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 la la bo ra ma 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 han da hai, o ya la la bo ra ma ma han da ya, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. How many of you just sensed God touching with something right then? It may have been a picture. It may have been a word. It may have been a, a, a scripture or something. You just sensed God uh, saying something to you. Hold up your hand right now. Hold up. Oh, this is incredible. This is incredible. And that, uh, Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I don't have time to, to work with you on feedback because if we had feedback, you'd be amazed at how God is saying similar things to so many people within the body of Christ. But uh, uh, because of our time, we're, I just wanted to give you a feel of it. It's so easy. Pastor Paul wanted me to share with you how to begin to move in the gifts of the Spirit. So today, I want to talk to you about four keys Four keys to moving in the gifts of the Spirit. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 3, please. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 6. The first key is to know who you are. Okay? Uh, Steve, would you read that, please? This mystery is that the gospel, the gen that through this gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. You know who you are. Know who you are. Dr. James Dunn, great scholar, non-Pentecostal, by the way, in fact, anti-Pentecostal. But Dr. James Dunn said a tremendous truth. He says this, until... We count the ordination of Sunday school teachers and distributors of church flowers as no different in essence from the ordination of an elder or bishop. We cannot claim to be functioning as the body of Christ. What he is saying is, you, every one of you is equally important in the body of Christ. Somebody say amen. You see, some of us have different responsibilities, but as far as value before God, we are all equally valuable before God. But a lot of us will say, but I feel so inadequate. I blow it all the time. I, I want you to know I make so many mistakes. It's not funny. As a senior pastor at Grace Assembly in Singapore, I thought, man, I must be the most inadequate pastor in all of Singapore. And uh, many times I think, boy, I should have said this to her, but I, I offended her instead. And I didn't greet that person. And, and, and sometimes my temper, uh, I know you're looking at me and say, what temper? <laughs> yeah, okay. God bless you. All right. Uh, uh, and oh God. And, and sometimes, sometimes in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about this and I wake up and I just laugh. That's because crying doesn't help anymore. <laughs> and I discovered that in my weakness, Christ's strength is made perfect. That when I realize that I am not perfect, then I see the goodness of God and the grace of God. And God's strength is made perfect in my weakness. And that God will receive all the glory. Then, he says in Ephesians 3, he says, we are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Now, we are all... Now, I, I, I could spend several hours talking to you about what the word body in scripture refers to. But the body implies, first of all, that you are not perfect. We are individuals in the body. I know in part, I share in part. What does that mean? I only have a part. Right. So that my word is not the complete word. That I have a gift, but you have gifts, and I need you, and you need me, and together we need one another as we move ahead in the Lord. And that's the beauty of it all, as we know that we need one another, and as a body in Christ we come to encourage one another, that's when the gift of faith begins to come in. You don't have to fight the battle yourself. 
I heard a preacher say the other day, the problem, you know, in Ephesians chapter uh, 6, it talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And he says, don't make we battles and I battle. Did you get that? Don't make we battles and I battle. In other words, when we're fighting spiritual warfare, when we're claiming victory for the sake of Jesus Christ, we fight together. We fight together to claim victory. But so many of us try to fight our own battles, and that's not the way it is in the body of Christ. We need one another. And so as we do that, the gift of faith rises. Then we begin to see healings take place as we join our faith together, and we pray, and we claim that victory. Years ago, when I was teaching in Bible school, a girl came to our Bible school, and she was, she was all wrecked up. She was a mess. Her father had abused her totally. She came broken and hurt. But there she came into an environment where fellow students loved her and reached out to her. There she began studying the Word of God and getting deeper in the Word of God. I met her a few years later. She was so joyful. She was so happy. I've never seen a more joyful soul winner in my life. God had brought healing into her life. Praise God. You see, that's what happens in the body of Christ. Healing flows through the body. And in a healthy body, greater healing can flow as we love one another. In all of our strengths and weaknesses, we love one another. We care for one another. Healing begins to flow in the body of Christ. So that everywhere we go, I know we make mistakes, but that's okay. God loves us anyhow. You know, we are his ambassadors. We are the body of Christ. So everywhere we go, we are to represent Jesus Christ. You know, I, I, I love it when I see an ambassador drive by. You know, he's driving one of these, uh, somebody's driving a big, beautiful limousine with flags stuck on the car and all the rest of that. And, and you know, this is an ambassador. He plays that role everywhere he goes. Well, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Everywhere you go, you represent Jesus Christ. Now, we're all going to blow it. I remember Dr. George Westlake, a good friend of mine. He's, he's in his mid-70s, but he, he's an outstanding Bible expositor and teacher in Kansas City, Missouri. He's called the Bible Answer Man. He's on television every week. He answers people's questions about the Bible. He knows the Greek. He knows the Hebrew. And he said one time he was shopping, and, and, and he got in the line, and as, as usual, we get in the longest line possible. We don't think so, but it gets delayed. And he was getting all up it in. He was about to tell that cashier off and say, you need to, you know, you need to move a little faster. And, and he came up and finally it was his turn to cash out at the cash register there. And the lady looked at him and says, Dr. George Westlake, I watch you every week on television. <laughs> and he says, I'm glad I didn't lose it at that point. <laughs> Sure, we're going to lose it at times. We are human beings, but the beautiful thing about that is God says, I will take care of that. You just seek to be the body of Christ because you are valuable. In the sharing of the gifts of the Spirit, when you realize you are important, then you know that God can use you. Somebody say amen. Amen. Okay, amen. So know who you are. Second, know what you have. Know what you have. Pastor Steve, Ephesians 3, verse 10 and 11, please. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you have a purpose. Ephesians 3.10 is the key to unlock the whole book of Ephesians. God's intent, when you understand Ephesians 3.10, you understand the key for the whole book. God's intent was that now, according to his eternal purpose, you should reveal the wisdom of God. So when you choose to do it God's way, You know, this world has all kinds of ways to do things. Corruption, uh, 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 all kinds of confusing ways to do things. But when we choose to do it God's way, God wins and Satan loses. When we choose to do it God's way, we're revealing the wisdom of God. It may not be the wisdom of 
human logic, but it is the wisdom of God. So that is our purpose, to reveal to all the principalities and powers, all the demonic forces, and to all the pre-believers out there, this is the way God would do it. And I choose to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I choose to put my mistakes under the blood of Jesus and move ahead for the glory of God. I choose to do my business the way I, that God would be honored. And when you choose God's way, God is honored. So the first thing you have, you have purpose. The se- or a purpose. Second, you have a plan. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 1. I want to show you a few verses. Verse 18. Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Open the eyes of your heart. In order that you may know three things. The hope to which he has called you. God has called you to a magnificent hope. Not only eternity in heaven. You know, we like to sing, I've got a mansion over the hilltop, a a harp, a home, a mansion. Yeah, we have a, uh, yeah, but, but more than that, we have a hope. We know God's plan shall be accomplished. We know God is going to vanquish evil. We know that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Then he says, secondly, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You see, the, the, the thing is, we think we have an inheritance because we're going to heaven. But this one says, God has an inheritance in you. God has a stake in your life. And he knows you will fulfill his plan. And then thirdly, his incomparably great power for us who believe. We have incredible power. Let's move on down to verse 21. This power, resurrection power, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. You see, far above, verse 22, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Jesus did it all for you. Do you understand the power you have? When you know who you are, do you really understand the power that you have? Dr. Karl Barth was my favorite theologian of the 20th century. His son, Dr. Marcus Barth, equally great scholar, a very charismatic believer, knew the move of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Dr. Karl Barth said this, when the humblest saint clasped his hands in prayer, would you clasp your hands like this? When the humblest saint clasps his hands in prayer, the demons have to flee. Do you know the demons just flew away? You say, is it because I'm a great intercessor and I pray five hours a day? No, that's not what he said. Is it because I'm such a man or a woman of God? No, that's not what he said. He said, when the humblest saint clasps his hands in prayer, the demons have to flee. Why? Because when you do that, you are declaring, I bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I bow before the one who conquered death, hell, and the grave. And I come before God. Do you understand the power that you have when you are doing that? You know, speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues is declaring the wonderful works of God, declaring the attributes of God, declaring that Jesus has risen from the grave, declaring that Jesus is all-knowing and all-powerful. That is power when we begin to glorify God in tongues. Then the word of knowledge, the word of knowledge. How many of you, maybe most of you are not preachers, but how many of you, whether teaching a cell group or teaching Sunday school, You have been preparing uh, uh, very diligently, but suddenly in the middle of that teaching, the Lord just helps you to say it in a higher way than ever before, and it suddenly comes together. Because the prime use of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge relates to God, God's wisdom and God's knowledge. 95% of the use of the word wisdom and knowledge in the Bible relate to God's knowledge and God's wisdom. How many of you, how many of you, when you've been teaching or sharing with people, All of a sudden, God has just lifted it to another level in this area. So the insight. And you say, boy, I wish I'd thought of that to begin with. Can I see your hand? Can I see your hand? Wow. So you see, you're already moving in the word of knowledge. 
you're already moving in the word of knowledge and the prime usage of the word of knowledge. Now, not all of us uh, have that gift quite as Sean Bowles does where it is so precise and, and so on. But do you know what the word of knowledge tells us? Is that almighty omnipotent God cares about you as an individual. Hallelujah. Oh, almighty omnipotent God knew what was happening to me in the late 1980s. As Sean Boltz has said, he knew the crisis I went through at that time. And, and still, and he says, I'm in charge of your life. That's what the word of knowledge tells us. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 And then the word of wisdom that applies in counseling, that applies when you're making decisions. That applies to those of us who are parents and, and we have decisions to make and God gives us words of wisdom. How many of you in counseling someone or in even decision making, maybe there's a conflict going on between you and someone else that is dear to you. But suddenly God gave you a word that brought peace to the whole situation and, 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 and miraculously it just seemed to resolve that situation. Can I see your hand please? Can I see your hand? You see, you're working, you're operating in the word of wisdom. One time when I was a teenager, I never attributed this to a word of wisdom. I was a counselor at a camp. I was a counselor at a camp, even as a teenager. I was a counselor for the teenagers because they didn't have enough counselors. And, and, and boy, one of the teenagers was acting up and I was going to show him the wrath of David Lim. <laughs> yeah, the wrath of David Lim. So I pulled him aside. <laughs> Boy, he was, he, was, he was shaking in his boots. He, he, he didn't know what to say. And suddenly God spoke to me and he said, love him. I, I, love him? Wait a minute, what? God gave me a word of wisdom. I spoke in a different way. You know, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. God gives you words of wisdom and God has given many of you words of wisdom along the way as well. Then the gift of deliverance and inner healing. My wife and I were in Asia. I won't tell you what country. We were having dinner with a friend of ours and uh, a, a very well-to-do friend of ours. And uh, while we were having dinner, he said, would you pray for my eight-year-old son? He hasn't had the gift of tongues yet. Would you pray for him? I said, I'll be glad to. We'll be glad to. So after dinner, we moved over to one side. And we began praying that he would receive the gift of tongues and we were praising God and all that. Suddenly the Lord spoke to me and said, open your eyes. I opened my eyes and he was just glaring right out there, just staring out there, this eight-year-old boy. And finally I said, wait a minute, let's stop praying. Something's wrong, something's wrong here. And, and I said to him, what's, what's going on? And he said, and I had to ask him several times and he said, you're not supposed to tell secrets, are you? eight-year-old boy. And I, I said, well, uh, it depends what the secret is. You see, he had been listening. He didn't know much English, but he had been listening to acid rock since he was four years of age. And he was listening to it day and night. And he, one of those acid rock songs talked about making a covenant with the devil. And he had made a covenant with the devil to kill his mother. Now he was an orphan child that was picked up in the wilderness somewhere and these wonderful Christian parents wanted to help to give him a future. And, and, uh, and somehow the devil spoke to him about killing him. He said, one time I even got a knife out. The, the, the mother and father were flabbergasted. They didn't even know what this happened. You know, this, this kid, eight years old, even he knew what back masking was. I think only some of you would know what back, how many of you know what back masking is? Okay, back, for the rest of you who didn't raise your hand, back masking is, it may sound like something played this way, but when you play it in reverse, there's another message that is there. He even knew about back masking at eight years of age. So I finally said, there's something here. We need to break this bondage. We need to break this bondage. So I said, what have you done with all of that acid rock music? This was back in the day of cassette tapes. Some of you don't even know cassette tapes. Right? We had cassette tapes. And he said, I only have one more left. And he, I said, bring it to me. And, and, and there in the living room, I, I, I held that cassette tape. He says, 
will you allow me to break this tape? And he looked at me and he said, but it costs a lot of money. His parents were multimillionaires. You see how the devil lies to you and he hides the truth and he, he pretends to be an angel, but it costs a lot of money. Finally, he said, yes, I need to break this bondage. I broke that tape. He screamed out. He screamed out. Ah! And, 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 and I said to the family, I said, listen, we have broken the legal bondage over this child. Okay. But he has been listening to the lies of the devil for four years. You need to get someone to, to mentor him and help him to really study the Word of God and deepen himself in the Word of God because you have to have the inner healing side of this as well as the deliverance side of this. The latest word I heard, he went on to Bible college. I think, if I am not uh, mistaken, he is now a pastor serving Jesus Christ. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you, you see, God gives us power even over the, the evil one. When we know what we have, we have power in Jesus Christ. Number three, be ready to be used. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 to 19. Pastor Steve, would you read that, please? I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Point number three, be ready to be used. The ready position is all crucial. Now, one of the things... I, I'm not good at sports, but I love sports. <laughs> in football, you got to get in a ready position. In basketball, you have to be in a ready position. You can't be caught flat-footed, if you understand what I'm saying. In any kind of sport, you've got to be in a ready position. If you want to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, you don't get in the couch potato position. You know? I, I, we had a teenager in our church in San Francisco years ago, and he looked like a couch potato. He looked like he was part of the couch. And I said, what are you doing? He said, vegetating. Oh, God have mercy. You, you see, the point is, we need to be ready. And if we're ready to listen to the Spirit, God shows us love that even surpasses knowledge, that you will know the height, the depth, the width of all of God's love that surpasses anything the human mind can comprehend. So there are five things you can do right here under being ready to be you. Number one, you provide a spiritual covering of love for your family. You provide a covering. This is spiritual work. This is spiritual warfare. My wife's father had two wives. And, and I'm not going to get into all the details of that. You know the complications that would arise there in every way, emotionally and, and all of that. But we determined to break that curse and to break that bondage. Today, my wife and I have been married 45 years, and my kids are happily married and serving God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You provide that spiritual covering for your family. All right. Second, you speak words of life or death. You can speak blessing into people's lives. That is an anointing of God to prophetically build people up. You speak blessing into people's lives, not curses into people's lives. I've seen people that have received uh, uh, words of negativity and curse when they were children, and they grew up even though they were beautiful and educated and intellectual, they always felt like they were insufficient, inadequate, and failure. But we speak blessing into our kids' lives. We speak blessing into our spouse's life. You know, I really appreciate what Pastor Paul and Pastor Denise are modeling for us up here. Do you know they're not doing this just to, just to show how romantic or how much they love each other? They're trying to model for you, this is the way we need to treat one another in Jesus Christ. We need to add value to one another and we speak blessing into their lives. Thirdly, you use the keys of the kingdom. Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, please. Steve? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, Jesus said, when he said, I will build my church, he gave you the keys to the kingdom. There are a lot of people that cannot find forgiveness and release until a human being can show them that kind of release. You see, we don't just go to a priest in a church. We go to every believer in Jesus Christ. You are a priest unto God. You're a priest unto God. And, and, and you can help them to find the forgiveness of Jesus Christ and find reconciliation as they confess their sin. Then we can tell them, hey, my Jesus has forgiven you. And he wraps his arms around you and receives you. Amen. Number four, you pray. You pray. And as you pray, God gives you words of knowledge. He tells you, hey, by the way, pray for this need. Pray for this brother. Pray for this family member. How many of you have experienced that? Before something's happened, God has, before you knew something was happening, God told you to pray for a certain person or a certain situation. Can I see your hand? Okay. You see, that's a word of knowledge. God's already been giving you that word of knowledge, and, and then you begin to pray into that, that need. Okay. You pray. And then, fifthly, you ask God for wisdom. James chapter 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to every man wisdom. Okay, you ask. God gives you wisdom in that situation. Okay, number four, claim God's promises. Okay, so number one, know who you are. You are valuable. You are the part of the body of Christ. Second, know what you have. Third, be ready to be used. And number four, claim God's promises. Pastor Steve, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, please. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is a powerful God. Some of you may have lost territory in your lives over these years. You made a bad decision somewhere. I have good news for you. You can claim back that lost territory. <laughs> Hallelujah. You can begin to understand that God will take the years that the locusts have eaten and he can give you a new day. And in that new day, you can even be more effective for God than you've ever been before. You may say, but how could God redeem it? I've made so many mistakes in my life. You know, I'm thinking John Ponder here. You know, you went to prison. You made some terrible mistakes. I don't know what they were, but you went to prison. And, and you regretted it all along the way. But now, because of the redemption of Jesus Christ, now you have empathy for these prisoners. You have wisdom to know how to touch their lives. You have an anointing on God. You have a ministry you would never have had if you hadn't laid it all before the Lord and God had set you free from that. And now hundreds and maybe thousands of people are touched by the power of God and because God can redeem the past. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. You see, God not only redeems you from sin, he redeems the past and he turns it around and in whatever years are ahead or months are ahead, you can be more productive for the kingdom of God than ever before. We had a lady in our church who, who was a brown robe nun in the Buddhist uh, religion. Brown robe was almost at the highest level. She was so committed in her animism and Buddhism, but she gave her heart to Jesus Christ. And our older folks in our church, you know, they are fearless. They're fearless. They're not worried about your feelings and opinions. She got her whole family around her by her bedside as she was about to die. And she said, every one of you better give your life to Jesus Christ. Wow, and most of them did. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, God can take even a short span of time and make you effective for the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. So, if we rise in faith, if we see the great power of God, we can pray for the sick. We can claim miracles. We can speak blessings for people's lives. We can claim our relatives, our sons and daughters who, who maybe are not believing in Jesus Christ. We can claim them for the Lord because God cares for them more than you care for them. Do you understand? 
God cares for them more than you care. We've had so many, so many people in, in Singapore whose parents, they prayed for 30 years, 40 years, and then just before they died, they received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So praise God. Don't give up. Don't give up at all. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, because Jesus is all-powerful, we live in light of His coming. As Jesus is coming, then He takes care of all the past, and He has already prepared the future for us. So we move ahead victoriously. You may be broken today, but I want you to know you are victorious in Jesus Christ. I want you to know that when you know you're victorious, you know you're valuable, you know what you have, you're ready to let God use you even in the midst of your brokenness, then you are ready to claim God's promises. You're ready to flow in all the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah! 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 Let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's bow our heads in prayer right now. You know, some of you, some of you, your, your, your lives have been like burnt toast. You've made terrible mistakes along the way. You're saying, I don't even know what the future holds. God says, I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. And I will redeem the past. I will forgive you of your sin. God says, there's nothing you've done that I cannot forgive. I will forgive if you will come before me. I will touch your life and I will transform your life. Several people in the first service already said, I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. So I have two questions today. First of all, are you here today and you say, boy, I need... I, I need God to, to help me claim lost territory. Bad decisions in business, bad decisions in the family, bad decisions all along the way. I need to reclaim lost territory for the glory of God. Would you, would you just raise your hand? We want to believe God for miracles in your life. Amen. 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 I understand. I understand. And I want you to know more than I understand. God understands. God loves you. All right. Secondly, I want to ask how many of you are here today and you would say, Pastor David, you know, I'm not really right with God. I, I've not given my heart to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus wants to empower you. Jesus wants you to fulfill your potential. Jesus wants to anoint you by the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to forgive you of your sins. Jesus wants you to know today can be the first day of the rest of your life. The rest of your life living the way God wants you to live. Are you here today and you say, Pastor David, pray for me. I want to get right with God today. I want Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior today. Would you just raise your hand high all over this congregation? Yes, yes, I see your hand. I'm looking over to my left, your right. Yes, I see about three hands there towards the middle here. Yes, all right, yes, I see your hand and your hand. Yes, 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 and I see your hand over here. Yes, okay, to my right, your left. How many of you will raise a hand and say, Pastor David, I need to get right with God. Amen. Yeah, I see your hand. I see your hand over here to my right. Yeah, anyone else? Okay, you can put your hands down. I'm going to ask the intercessors, the counselors to come forward, please, right now. We're going to touch God together. We're going to claim God's release on every one of our lives. Because you can't do it in your strength. You are inadequate. But God is more than adequate. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. I want to ask all of you who raised your hands and others of you who didn't raise your hands, I want you to come forward and let us pray with you. I'm going to ask my wife to come around the altar as well. We want to minister into your lives. There is life in Jesus Christ. You want to get right with God. You come. Let's give a hand of applause to these who are coming right now. Let's encourage them. That's right. There's no shame. We are a family together in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's begin to break those bondages of doubt, those bondages of guilt, those bondages of fear. You come right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.